trap, 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 trap. <laughs> With your host, Dino AGL. Welcome, people. So, today, the Galactic Talk now session 18. Uh, we have someone really uh, with special information, and she did actually accept my request a couple months ago. So, without further ado, I want you to know. And I will introduce you to Sue Walker. So Sue, welcome. Thank you so much, Tano. I've been looking forward to this since you first contacted us and we're happy to share with you the crazy unusual things that have happened to us in the last several years with some extraterrestrials that operate out of a base beneath the Sandia Mountain on the eastern edge of Albuquerque. So we have a big story to tell you, and it's kind of unprecedented. So uh, we're going to have fun and just be honest with everything that we've got. Um, if you want to uh, introduce us, um, we also have with us uh, my spouse, Reverend White Otter. He's here next to me uh, just off screen. And if you hear a mysterious male voice, adding to the conversation. Um, it's probably Reverend White Otter kibitzing and adding his two cents. But thank you for having us. Really, really looking forward to this. Well, you know, it's our pleasure. And today with you, we're gonna take a look at her bio when she was approached to work on special projects with the three letters agencies. And then we're gonna see as a, uh, I'm gonna call it, you know, a secret place, uh, secret and secret at the same time, because mountains, uh, there's underground bases and Sue, Sue actually is gonna show us, it's gonna tell us what's going on inside, you know, that mountain called Sandia in uh, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then after this, we're gonna dive, we're gonna dive with or you know, the uh, Panty Star Nation, where they're coming from, how Sue really, you know, initiated a contact with them. And then after this, we'll go, you know, on and on with some, actually with some questions, probably out of the blue. But the thing is, we're gonna focus is we're gonna go, you know, beyond, beyond the horizon, how I could say, you know, attacking information that that's probably not being shared, you know, on the mainstream. So without further ado, we're gonna um, see actually in here, Sue uh, Bio. So Sue, I'm just gonna share my screen right away. It won't be long. All right. So for the people that may ask, I actually knew uh, Sue actually her story and uh, the whole thing about, you know, the Panty Star Nation from this Human Origins Conference 2021 that was held back in March of this year, you know, with Rick and Lytton Smith. So without further ado, we're gonna take a look at Sue Walker bio. And at the same time too, her husband, Otto, we're gonna check is by as well. So Sue Walker is an internationally known clairvoyant, psychic, medical, intuitive, and a lifelong experience of ET slash UFO phenomenon. People around the world have been seeking out her psychic and medical intuitive advice. For over 20 years, she has assisted individuals, CEOs of businesses, physicians, actors, and law enforcement agencies, including the police, the FBI, and the CIA. Her psychic readings and medical intuitive readings are sought out for there are levels of accuracy and detail. Frequently asked to investigate hauntings or paranormal activity, Sue's been featured in various publications. 
uh, television documentaries and radio appearances. Sue also conducts training seminars during the year because she desires to educate the public about various forms of psychic phenomena, improving mm -hmm. psychic skills and exploring mm -hmm. remote viewing, mm -hmm. scrying or energy projection. She travels the country presenting lectures and workshops on psychic readings, medical intuitive readings, telepathy, and other paranormal and spiritual issues. Mm -hmm. In September 2013, she was unexpectedly contacted by an extraterrestrial while visiting the Albuquerque, New Mexico area mm -hmm. for the first time. A strong friendship with his E.T., nicknamed Sandia, began to develop with her and her spouse, Rev. White Otter. In the years that follow, this couple will continue to dialogue with and translate for not only Sandia, known as Commander Tukum, mm -hmm. but several other extraterrestrials who operate out of a facility beneath the Sandia Mountains as well. Mm -hmm. And her spouse, so Otter, has traveled the shaman's path for more than 40 years and has been involved with teaching energy work for most of that time. A true Renaissance man, Otter owes a master's in philosophy and a degree in the culinary arts, has been an 18th century historic reenactor as well as a professional nurse greenman. Otter has been a long, long, lifelong contact and is currently working as a translator for the Panti of the Sandia Mountain. So together, Sue and Otter have volunteered more than 10,000 hours since June 2015, assisting in the telepathic translation for the Twitter account, Sandia the ET. They have aid in translating the first known collaborative earth human panty publication mm -hmm. which is available on the website and so is going to present more later all right mm -hmm. so without being said i'm just going to stop the sharing um yeah so sue right away that's really interesting a lot of <laughs> things that you have a lot to start share. with isn't it yeah. <laughs> where would you like so, to begin so we're gonna we're gonna start prior 2013 uh when we were exchanging you were mentioning that you were approached to work on special projects by the three letters agencies mm -hmm. so right away uh you mentioned project stargate mm -hmm. please tell us to people how you were approached and right. what exactly you were working okay all yeah. right um i met uh dr Dale Graff, who headed up the CIA's remote viewing division um, uh, and was the CIA, uh, and was heading up project, but the, at that point was called Project Stargate. I met him after he retired from Project Stargate. And he and I sat down and talked physics and paranormal experience and uh, wrote back and forth as friends for several years between about 1998 and 2001. In, during that time, Dr. Graff contacted me and asked if I would please, or, or if I would be interested in working on a murder case that happened on the East Coast at a military base, uh, pardon me, a, a retired military person uh, actually, we have two murder cases, one that happened on a military base and one that happened on the East Coast to a newly retired military person. So that's how I got to know Dr. Graff. But also the other thing is after we had worked together for a short period of time, when 9-11 happened in 2001, that was 20 years ago, guys, I got contacted by other clairvoyants and other really top-notch psychics around the world. And all of them were getting information about what had happened 
to cause 9-11 and who was involved. The, we were all talking amongst each other as psychics. And so I contacted Dr. Graff and I said, we're all getting all this spontaneous information. We don't know what to do with it. And so he reopened um, kind of a small division of Project Stargate and acted as a clearinghouse for psychic information from about a half a dozen of us for several months at the end of 2001. And any overlapping information, he passed on to the CIA and the Pentagon. And so that was my history with Project Stargate, Dr. Graff. Prior to that, I had experience working for the FBI on murder and missing person cases. I uh, worked for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation on a missing gal case. So I've got a smattering of three letter agency people who either I volunteered for or they've contacted me with questions. And we always keep things kind of on the QT. Um, I'm not one to blow my own horn on things like that. And it worked out better for them to, to have it kind of private between us, but they did pass along the information and um, ended up, I suppose a half a dozen three letter agencies throughout that I am aware of and other employees of unusual agencies who I had described to them that they were gonna get this job with a strange, strange three letter agency and they would call me years later and say, I want to tell you, thank you. I got the job that you described, but I can't tell you the agency I'm working for or what I'm doing, but I just wanted to call and tell you, thank you, because I wouldn't have applied for this if I hadn't talked to you. So we had casual back and forth interaction that way too. But most of them contacted me spontaneously because of the accuracy and the detail. So that's kind of the history with the three letter agencies. Sounds good. Yep. And I uh, just want to give that, you know, suspense before talking about that metaphysical experience with the uh, Ponte Nations. So you mentioned a currency, right? Uh, could you please share to the people some things that she had to either, either remote viewing, you mentioned uh, medical, intuitive. Um, when I was in college. I took coursework for both pre-med and pre-vet studies. And it's heavy in the sciences and heavy in the understanding of, of anatomy, physiology, microbiology, chemistry, organic chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Anything a doctor or a veterinarian needs to know, that's, those are the things that I was studying. When I, I made the decision to not go into traditional Western medicine because traditional Western medicine and I weren't gonna quite get along. I am not one to say, take this pill, do this um, artificial thing as much as what can you do at home and when do you really need to go to a doctor? The same level of detail that I worked with investigators on missing person and murder cases is the same level of detail that I get when somebody asks me medical questions, the same visual images come up and in layers and layers of information, like um, a sh several sheets of paper, one on top of another. And so I have to peel off the layers and each one contains a great amount of detail. And so the medical intuitive part came just because I had done the study of the workings of the body and the anatomy and the physiology. And I knew what to call things and, and I knew how they worked. And the systems. So I, the, that's, that's the medical intuitive part. Um, when people call me, I, I first describe to them what's going on and sometimes I'll sketch it out. Um, the artist in me has been improved greatly because of my extraterrestrial friends recently. And we'll get into all of that in a moment. But um, the medical intuitive part, again, the same level of detail is as easy for me with the medical things as it is for the missing person cases. So that's where the medical intuitive part kind of dives in. All of this 
existed and I had a 20 year career before I met our extraterrestrial friends. Um, in 1998, I was at home in Iowa. I was with my previous spouse, not with White Otter. And I was in bed in June of 98 after a sighting of a UFO on the southern edge of town. 10 days before that, on June 4th, I had the sighting. And about June 10th-ish, so a week-ish to 10 days later, I didn't write down the date, I should have. Um, one of the tall, eight foot tall, large mm -hmm. almond shaped eyes, gray white skin tone, more white than gray, um, creamy almost, mm. long, long arms, long fingers, fewer fingers than we had, but I confess at that point in time, I didn't stop to count fingers. I was too focused on, there was this strange tall being approaching the foot of my bed in the middle of the night. And I had woken up and frozen watching him hmm. move across my room. After he reached out and attempted to stroke the leg of my then spouse, he reached over to me and wanted to stroke my leg under the sheets. And I suddenly sat up and I yelled at him and I said, what are you doing here? And the ET startled at the foot of my bed, got this aghast look at his face, turned and walked straight through the wall. And I did something very uncharacteristic. You would think I would have woken up my spouse at the time, I did not. I laid straight back down and went back to sleep and I didn't recall everything until I woke up in the morning. 10 days later, I woke up and there were four smaller, four and a half foot tall, mm. large almond shaped eyes, grayer skin tone, long skinny arms, long skinny fingers at the foot of my bed, four. And one of them was taking a device and pressing it against the skin of my calf. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I had this terrible bone pain for a, a little period of time. Mm -hmm. And pain was what actually woke me up. And I watched him take this device away from my leg. After that, every time it was going to be what I came to term a UFO kind of night, the back of my calf would become um, mm -hmm. red and hot. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I felt that it was going to be a UFO kind of night, about three hours. So yeah. I assumed that what it was, was some kind of a GPS tracker. And to my knowledge, it's still there, although it hasn't, it was, it raised a rash about yay big and was itchy and red for about two years. And then it kind of faded. Wow. Yeah. Weird, huh? And that was all before, see, 98 to 2013. So 16 years lapsed between the time I saw the four Zeta body type extraterrestrials at the foot of my bed and when Commander Tilkum or Sandia first contacted us in September of 13. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is something. It is something. I asked, yeah. after that experience in 98, I stood out in the backyard and screamed at the sky one night. And I said, would you please just talk back to me? I have questions and I can't help you if you won't have a back and forth dialogue. Mm -hmm. Please just talk to me. And I begged them in 1998 to respond to me. The first one I ever had respond to me was August of 99. Yeah. And I woke up on board a ship. Hmm. And that's when I saw my first, what I call a reptarian. Reptarian is like a reptilian whose ancestry originally came from this planet. 
and he was about five foot tall, dark brown, leathery, scaly skin, and he spoke to me. And he was the first one to answer me back because when I woke up on board this ship, I stood in the middle of this red lit room with all of these Zeta body type little guys around the edge of the room that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. There were other earth humans all following one of them in a line that left the room. And I stopped in the middle of the room, realized where I was, put my hands on my hips and said, will somebody please tell me what's going on here? And then this Reptaran answered me. And that was the first time that I asked a question and got an immediate response. That was 99. Mm -hmm. Then when I met Otter and came to visit him down here in New Mexico for the first time, that was September of 13. Mm -hmm. I'd been here 10 days. Not Just 10 days. You had been here a week. Okay. It was the, the fall equinox. And we were watching TV one night and kibitzing about the show that we were watching. It happened to be America's Bat Talent. And I was telling Otter, gee, that performer was really good. I think he should win. And something really weird happened. In my head, clear as the bell, came this male voice, calm, quiet, but very definitely clear. And the male voice said, he was good. I think he should win. And without knowing why, my head whipped around and I stared out our picture window at the Sandia Mountain. And for reasons I did not know then and understand better now, the voice came from a specific spot on the mountain underground. And then it went silent. And I thought, what was that? That wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a spirit. It wasn't even in the room with us. How the heck does he know what we're watching on TV? And who was that? And I didn't have an answer. The next day I heard him again. And the day after that, I heard him a third time. Finally, I figured I better ask Otter and say, Otter, um, you ever hear a voice coming from the mountain? I keep hearing this guy. And Otter said, oh, them. They've been talking ever since I moved into here. Why? <laughs> so he'd moved into the home in 2009, the fall, the fall of 09, and they started immediately talking to him. Only and they, because they already knew that I would, could hear him and would and would listen to him somewhat. Yep, right. So they, what we call ping people telepathically mm -hmm. all the time, but mm -hmm. they seldom get somebody who responds or who responds without fear or who responds and asks them a question back and says, hi, who are you? So when I started to answer a question back to Sandia, that's when things started to move forward. We gave this voice from the mountain a nickname. It came from the Sandia Mountain. That sounded like a name to me. So I just called it Sandia. And it had nothing to do with Sandia National Labs. It had nothing to do with anything spooky military connected. It had nothing to do with their underground laboratories that are 10 miles south of here in the Manzano Mountains but people assume because of the name Sandia that it was connected. To be honest, there are thousands of businesses here that are called the Sandia this or the Sandia that. Mm -hmm. Sandia plumbing, Sandia window cleaning, yeah. Sandia whatever. And so just because of the mountain. So Sandia the ET mm -hmm. that had begun talking to me, we started a dialogue. We started talking back and forth Otter could hear him as clearly as I could. And it was two months before I asked this guy's real name. And when I asked him, he answered, and he answered in detail. He said, my real name is Dukum. And I said, what? He said, Dukum. And I said, slower. He said, Dukum, like louder was gonna help. And I said, slower, Dukum. I said, Dukum. And he indicated that was close enough. Then he spelled it T-L-K-M. 
and he said, our language seldom uses vowels unless they are borrowed. And so their written language is all consonants, but it's pretty easy to read. Yeah, sometimes you have to figure out the pronunciation a little bit. Yeah. But um, we got to know Tilkum, and he is the manager of what he called the Sandia Mountain Information Station. I said, what's that? He said, we are an interstellar information station for visiting star nations that come to Earth and need the latest intel and information about everything from what the Earth humans are currently doing to where their people are mm -hmm. to the state of our sun and our solar system, like you get the weather. And so that role of information station is what they're here for. And they are supervised by and are a member of allies of Earth, but they work under the Federation. And they have not named all of the planets or all of the peoples interstellar that belong to the Federation, but they answer to the communications division of the Federation. And Tilkum occasionally leaves the station and goes to meetings on the moon. That's as much as I know about that. Excellent. So that's kind of how this got started. But over time, just chatting with Tilkum just a little bit every day, we got to know the guy. Like you would get to know your neighbor across the backyard fence. Mm -hmm. and so little by little, just in conversation without ever pressing in for details, we learned about the Pontel, uh, the Ponte. Pontel is the name of the, their world. Zeta Reticuli 2. Zeta Reticuli is a star in the constellation of Reticulum, which is a Southern Hemisphere constellation. It has two suns. It's a binary system where the stars revolve around each other. The further of those two stars right now is Zeta Reticuli 2, and they say their planet is the fifth one in that system. That information they gave us in November of 13. Gotcha. And we're not afraid to give us the details. So that's how things began. And we've been collecting the information that they have shared with us and turning around and recording it. But we had something really strange happen in May of 2015. Commander Tilkum, out of the blue, piped up one day, came to us and said, we understand Earth has something called social media. And I went, uh-oh, yes. Radar. And apparently one of the other staff members of the Sandia Mountain Information Station who monitors our media had spoken to him about it. And he, Tilcom asked, would it be permitted for us to open an account? And at the time I was only on Facebook. I didn't understand any other social media. And I'll be the first to admit I am not techie. So we tried opening a Facebook account for them so that they would be able to teach and share. And after a month, Tilcom was not happy with the speed of the information distribution. And he asked if there were other social media platforms. And that's when we opened up the Sandia, the ET or at Sandia Wisdom Twitter account. And three of the staff members of the information station, Commander Tilcom, another male, young male by the name of Rahaz, which we nicknamed Radar, and then uh, Gal by the name of Jeruti. And say Trudy, like the girl's name, only start it with a J and you'll be pretty close. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tilcom, Trudy, and Radar all began sharing on Twitter in June of 2015, and they very quickly became very popular. And so people asked them questions at live and they answered in live real time. 
and astonished some people with what they knew and what they could do. And then something else happened a year later in June of 2016, Tilcom came to us and said, I have a teacher for you. Oh shit. And I said, <laughs> you, you have a teacher for me. He said, this is to me. And it was a gal, a female, also Ponte. And he introduced her as our new telepathy teacher. She worked with us for more than a year. And in the process wrote the okay. first Earth Human Ponte published collaboration of a manual instructing us, Earth humans, mm -hmm. how we can improve our telepathic skills to understand and communicate with them, as well as protocols for what's the right way to contact a star nation and invite them. Mm -hmm. And so in December of 17, on the winter solstice, we published Tanis Telepathy 101 Primer in English. In less than three months, mm -hmm. it was translated into 10 Earth languages by volunteers across yep. the world. And people began to practice their telepathy and invite the Ponte. And then all heck broke loose. We got calls, we got emails, we got text messages. We had people knocking on our front door who had traveled halfway around the world to come see us in person. Yep. And, and that uh, began the sharing of other people inviting the Ponte by following the instructions in the Telepathy 101 primer, go to the documents section. See where documents is number two? Yeah. All right. So there it is. Official first contact is the Ponte's website. This is all of the information they have provided to us for free. And as much as we can, we have made it as detailed and as accurate as we are able. So you can get it in all these languages. Currently, it's being translated into sign language with a, net, a camera on a person reading it aloud so that it can, for lip readers. So this is Tanis Telepathy 101 Primer. And again, all it does is take you from where you are right now with whatever telepathic skill set you feel like you do or do not have, and it gives you ways to improve it. And then at the end, it will give you the protocols for contact. And so uh, to me, uh, in, gave instructions for how you do this and made it as easy for the lay person as possible without any scientific jargon or language. And if there is any, she explains that in lay person's terms. So that's the story of the Telepathy 101 Primer's beginnings. But if you, I'm sorry, if you go to back to official first contact, you'll notice that there is an evidence page and all of the people all across the world in whatever language they speak, used the primer and contacted the Ponte and then invited them to come to their homes. And when they did, they provided us back the evidence. So if you go down, if you go to the very top thing where it says evidence, right, you will see video. The, the first thing you've got is audio. Commander Teokum and Grayson spoke into microphones for us, whispered. I didn't they, hear they have vocal cords, they just don't use them. Watch out. Right. So the story of, of Watch out. <laughs> Otter is being. All right, so the story of what's up or was up is one day somebody contacted us on Twitter and said, if I ask for a visit and somebody comes, how do I know it's on D? I said, that's a fair question. We need a password phrase. So I contacted the Ponte 
and our friend Radar happened to be over there. I said, Radar, we need a good, short, easy to remember password phrase so that people know it's really you. What should we use? And he said, was a, I said, what's up? Okay, that's good enough, done. So I contacted all the regular folks that at that point in time were getting visited and said, okay, the radar has said he will practice saying what's up in his out loud voice, which is a whisper or a very small voice. But I told all of the other people that were having regular contact and we spread the word out on Twitter. 11 hours later, we got our first audio capture. Radar went straight to the house of uh, one of our regular contactees who you see a lot of these videos, um, Jason Gerhardt. And Jason set up a microphone at his house and he put a note on it. He said, the microphone is on, it's recording. If you wish to speak into it, that would be great. If you wish, um, use your phrase, what's up? And so 11 hours later, Radar whispered, what's up? What's up? Into the microphone. We got two audio captures of, uh, one audio capture of Radar, one of Grayson, and then one of Commander Tilkum saying, I was here now, to one of our contactees in Michigan. Yeah. So it's not just one other person other than Otter and I who are getting visited. It's not just two. It's not just the United States. It's not just North America even. No. We have people providing us stories and evidence of their contact from every continent now except Antarctica. Yeah. Hmm. yeah we just recently got contacted by somebody in Africa. Didn't we? Yes, yeah. we did. That yes, was we did. Shot. Morocco. Yeah, Morocco. Mm -hmm. If you, if I could characterize the visits of the Ponte, they are not the scary ET visits that you hear about in Hollywood movies and television. No. They're not. Not at all. Mm -hmm. They're people. They're like us. They have a sense of humor like us. Um, if you would like to hear some of the more unusual stories, the humorous stories, two of the contactee experiencers, one from Canada and one from Australia, got together and put together a YouTube channel called Close Encounters of the Pontel Kind. And what it does is it retells the true stories of what's happening to people all over the planet. Um, some of them are our stories, some of them are Australian stories, some of them are Canadian stories, some of them are from the United States. There are several episodes to Close Encounters of the Pondell kind, but it's the unusual stuff and the humorous stuff that happens. And so you'll see everything from them dancing in somebody's bedroom and bouncing on somebody's bed to, I think the first episode is called Oh Snap, and the Ponte pulled back the underwear band oh, yeah. of somebody's shorts and snapped them. Yeah. And so the episode is called Oh Snap. Um, they've taught, they, you'll just have to go to the YouTube channel. It's so hard to describe the variety that's there. Um, you'll have a good time. Yeah. I highly recommend yeah. it. Um, to the two hosts, uh, Wookie is the Australian host and Kevin Estrella is the Canadian host and they do a good job. So go to visit that YouTube channel and you can hear the stories, sometimes in people's own words of all of the things that the Ponte are doing in their visits that are kind of the non-standard funny stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's not so scary. Sounds it's good. Not, not nearly as scary as what people think. So, uh, Sue, uh, we did chat about it quickly. Uh, people that's in the know or probably had some experiences knows uh, the grays, right? From Ziti Reticuli. Mm -hmm. uh, there are actually more than one 
star nation that look like what you call the grays. Exactly. Um, there's at least five very similar body types that overlap and people confuse them and lump them all into the same category. They are not. So when you say the grays, I'm going to politely say, if you want them to say Zeta body type, that would be more accurate mm -hmm. because it includes the creamy skin colored folks as well as the gray or the more taupe colored mm -hmm. skin type. Um, there are at least five worlds and then those worlds, some of them have genetically merged so that you have somebody from one planet having a baby with somebody else from another planet, mm -hmm. but the body types are, are compatible enough that they can um, have children. Yeah. And so that's why we say five plus Zeta body types now visiting Earth. And so we... We also got corrected by Commander Tealcom about the use of the phrase, the grays. And what he said was this. He said, please don't call me a gray. That term is insulting. I don't call you a pink or a brown. Mm -hmm. And so, all right, point well taken. So we try and stay away from calling them alien and grays because of their request. It was a polite request. And I didn't see any reason why we couldn't honor it. So that's, so you're, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Your question about the Zeta body type people is what? Excellent. No, it's good to make that distinction because myself personally, before I went to Orion, but Orion, some of the narratives is, you know, only negative beings. Yeah, you get a mix from the Orion area constellation, and we've met several. So I sympathize. Yeah, I really do. Sounds good. And you know, now they do have their station. Yes, senior station. Uh, let's go into details. Sure. What are they? What are they doing? <coughs> All right, at, at at the Sandia Mountain Information Station. All right, it's huge. All right, the earth humans who have ventured into that portion of the underground of the Sandia Mountain mm -hmm. um, repair people. There was a welder who put out a story online and you can read it. You can find the welder that tells of the story beneath the Sandia Mountain mm -hmm. of the airstrip that's the largest airstrip he's ever seen that rivaled airstrips on land that were huge. It was long, it was, and the ceiling height in the airstrip was extremely high. Mm -hmm. There's the Sandia Mountain. Mm -hmm. All right, do you see where it says Sandia Crest on the left? Yeah. There you go. All right, if you go beneath that about halfway down, that's approximately where the voice that I first heard of Commander Teokums came from. We right. know two things from what they tell us. We do know that if you go to one of the little canyons mm -hmm. north of the Sandia Crest on this western slope, there is an entrance that's large enough for one of their small skipper ships to get into. Yeah. All right. But do you see where it says Palomas Peak? All right, on the in the middle of your screen, um, kind of to the right of Placitas. Yeah. That's the northwest portion of the Sandia Mountain, and on that northwest or northeast, pardon northeast. me, northeast. I misspoke. That's the northeast part of the Sandia Mountain, and that's where the vast majority of the larger ships come and go. There's a hangar bay door that opens and closes mm -hmm. on that side of the mountain, okay? Mm -hmm. And yep. so there is a flight path exiting that area of, of the northeastern side of the mountain. So yep. repeat that again, repeat that again, Sue. Uh, so the flight path, do you see the long line that's coming out from the mountain and curving. Yep, that's the one. So if you follow that line up into the mountain, 
you would be fairly close to following the typical flight path of them exiting at sunset and taken off on their nightly missions. When we, we also see them, and we don't know how, we, we also see them instead of exiting and going northeast, we see them from the top of the mountain in the little small skipper ships that are about the size of a small plane going straight up. So they will zip from, from what our view of the Sandia Crest is, mm -hmm. right about that area, we see them zip straight up as in a microsecond, in the blink of an eye. And that's a common thing here for us to see them. This area, UFO-wise, or UAP, if you want to use the current vernacular that's pop, pop, more popular, um, you will see on average some kind of an unusual anomalous ship once every six minutes if you do a sky watch in the Albuquerque area. It's busy. Mm -hmm. So this facility is an information station and it's an interstellar information station for other visiting star nations coming to Earth, wanting to know the latest details. So, of course, with the pandemic that's gone worldwide, they have informed the other human body type visitors to Earth, visitors that look almost identical to us very difficult to distinguish from us. They had to see if our pandemic would infect them. And they had to do that testing for every human body type nation that visits Earth. Now, one of the things Commander Teokum originally told us was that, you know, we're human too. We're just not Earth human. We're Pantel human. You're Earth human. There are many types of humans in this galaxy with slight variations on head size, eye size, number of fingers, height. So can you and have we photographed visitors to Earth that look like us only are 15 to 20 feet tall? Yeah, we have. There are photographs of very, very tall visitors walking up volcanoes in Mexico, Central and South America. So we have captured human being looking peoples that are not from here. Tilkum told us that on any given day, both in the oceans and on land, you can find somewhere between 75 and 80 separate star nations visiting Earth. Not, not total aliens or extraterrestrials, nations. So the Ponte currently have more than 200 staff members beneath the Sandia Mountain. We only know a, a couple of dozen, so less than 10% is are the people that we've been introduced to over there by name but there are a lot more and this is just one of four information stations on earth there are also four aquatic information stations because most of our planet is water guys 75 percent of the extraterrestrials that come visit earth don't come to see us they don't care about us they come because of our oceans. Hmm. Yeah. We just never see them. I got you. Okay. I got you. And, Other uh, questions? Good questions. Yeah. Uh, I just want to go back again. When sure. uh, Tukum told you that he's not appreciating, you know, the fact that uh, we reference by the term of the grays. Yeah, yeah, he just didn't want to be called a gray. But you know what? <laughs> I thought it was more polite to not call people by their skin color, but also 
he recognized the confusion of five separate nations all getting lumped together as one. Yeah. That's part of the problem. And that's pretty good, actually, because I'll take myself, for example. I have brown skin, you know, but, you know, being an indigenous uh, natural person, I do not uh, refer myself as black. And he's actually right. So color do not define or is not nope. an identity to you. We're all just human. Think, you We're know? Human. And so yeah. he refers to all of us, no matter what the culture is on earth as you're just earth human. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's, you just mentioned earlier, there are being supervised by another star nation. Several actually, <laughs> a group. Could and you, could you list some of them? Oh boy, um, the few that we know. All right. <clears throat> we know of the Jalo Hue, and that's the name of the nation that looks very similar to the Ponte, but is tall, eight foot tall. Mm -hmm. We know of the blue skinned, dark haired people. Uh, there is a city in India called Dwarka. Mm -hmm. And if you go into the history of Dwarka, it was built with the help of star nations. And some of them in their ancient history and their drawings portray them with dark blue skin. And in fact, yes, that's what they have. So that nation, um, we have met a Sauron nation that looks like a reptilian, only more amphibian, more like a frog, frog skin, not a frog face, salamander, gecko. Amphibian. So yeah. kind of a snout like you would see a um, gecko, gecko or lizard. a yeah. lizard have mm -hmm. and long neck. Yeah. And when we have been introduced to them, they're always hooded with a robe. Don't know why, it's just part of their culture. When we see them, their skin tones are brilliant. You're not talking about dark brown, muddy skin or gray. You're talking about parrot colors, fabulous blues, fabulous reds, amazing yellows, oranges, greens, and variations as bright as bird feathers, mm -hmm. okay? We've met that nation. Um, we, I'm trying to think of all of the people that I've drawn. My goodness. We know of the Reptarans, like the one that I met on board the ship. And Reptilian Rainbow people. and Reptaran are referred to separately if they are a Reptilian body type, but their origin was not from Earth. We call them Reptilian. So if it's a Reptilian nation from the draconian system. Mm -hmm. All right, we will refer to them as reptilian and they're okay with that. If they originated on earth and their ancestry is here and they were here before us, mm -hmm. we call them reptarian. And in fact, what they tell us is when their huge disaster happened here on earth 65 million years ago, 27 sentient reptarian nations became three because the others died. The gotcha. other nations were eliminated in the cataclysm. The three interbred with each other and basically became one with many variations. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? Well, all right, if I say canine to you, you think dog. How many different kind of variations of a dog look can you think of? From a Chihuahua to a Great Dane, to a Collie, to a German Shepherd. Several different ones. levels of different faces. They look like they aren't the same species, don't they? Mm -hmm. But they are. Yeah. And so the Reptarans have variations in their people's look, but they all refer to them as Reptaran because they came from here originally. And there are some underground facilities, cavern facilities. Our underground, what's beneath our feet, 
to say hollow earth isn't quite right, but honeycombed earth would probably be more accurate. Yeah. Some of the cavern systems are huge and some of them are inhabited. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, mountains, there's, you know, sometimes there's stargates or portals or inside there's, you know, ancient beings mm -hmm. went through actually exiled through mountains and to, uh, let's say, on the worlds. So, yeah. you know, where my part of my family, they're coming from, Ayeti or Haiti, there's this uh, narratives when people go under the water to a different world. So mm -hmm. the uh, Panty and with Tukum, what, what's their stake on the- uh, Portals and gateways and- And civilization, you know. What do you wanna know? Okay, so what we know is spotty, but there are what you would commonly refer to as a portal, mm -hmm. an ancient means of shifting more easily into a dimensional state to travel. Mm -hmm. right? And there are two types of portals that Tilcom talks to us about. There are the natural portals mm -hmm. that are essentially powered by the planet itself. They're just here areas where the energy is different and it's easier to open up a portal and travel. Those ancient portals, um, Mount Shasta has one. Mont Blanc in France has one. Um, you talk about a, a Mount Fuji has a portal. Uh, the Four Corners area has a portal. There's a kind of a portal surrounded by not so nice beings around what's the place up in uh, the United Mountains that's the ranch Skinwalker Ranch Skinwalker. that's the place so there's a, a portal up there that's a public portal too but it's got a reputation for having not so nice beings around it mm -hmm. so there are some areas where the portals even though they're public can, and can be used by any star nation. Um, uh, some of them have been, kind of been claimed by mm, people not as nice as the Ponte. We'll put it that way. Gotcha, yeah. There are also artificially created mechanical portals that are not Earth-based or planet-based that if I have... Um, the technological capability in my ship to open a portal so that I can travel quickly to somewhere else. That's what I'm referring to as a mechanical portal. And those can be opened up just about anywhere, but um, are not the natural ones that when people walk into an area and they're they can transport to another place, it's different than a mechanical artificial one that opens up and then is gone. The earth-based ones remain and they don't go away. The mechanical ones travel with the ships. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And uh, is Intel on, let's call it, let's call it, you know, uh, underground civilization or uh -huh waters that are below the source of the waters. So what's tickle intel on what we cannot see? Oh, let's say like the the majority of the people is not seeing at the surface, but what's below, even like to different densities. Okay, so we've had some discussion with them about different densities and different dimensions. Um, it's not an easy topic because their definitions and ours don't quite match up. And so we have to first come to an understanding as to when you say the word density, what are you talking about exactly? Or if you refer to dimension, what is it that you mean? And are you talking about state of matter? Are you talking about vibrational level? So 
when we talk about those things with the Ponte, we first establish a definition of what it is that we're talking about so that we both are on the same page. Yeah. So that I don't assume that their definition of density or dimension is the same as mine. So that's the first thing we, that's the first hurdle we had to overcome translation wise. And then when they started to describe things, it, because our science and theirs are not exactly the same. Again, we ran into translation problems, but what we do know is that when you are in one of their vessels and you want to travel quickly from point A to point B, do they shift into a different density state or dimensional state in order to facilitate that process? And does that take them into something that goes beyond a wavelength that our eyes can see? So do they go invisible is what I'm saying. Yeah, we can't, our eyes don't have the spectrum to understand and follow track with when they shift. So in our eyes, you have a, a Ponte vessel and you know it's Ponte um, in a couple of ways. One, they have ovals, like little Tic Tacs, mm -hmm. saucers, like the classic saucer, and cylinder or cigar shaped ships where the ends of it can be round or, or absolutely flat. All of those vessels have no seams. They are either silver or white and are not colored. And you don't see you know, any lettering on the side when you walk up to it. You don't automatically see windows or doors. You don't see seams or rivets. It is a ship that is extruded in a dimensional sh process. So it's extruded so that it can handle that dimensional shift. All right, and extruded in one piece. When they talk about the ships that they have, the small skipper ships, they talk about them as if they are intelligent living beings. And they tell us that they have a biological mechanical mix and the ships themselves are sentient to a point and when we talk to the individual, the engineer that takes care of the ships at the Sandia station, he refers to the ships as his girls and treats it like it's a herd of horses more than treats it like it's a fleet of dead mechanical stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're living beings and he treats them like living beings once they are combined with their programming after they are extruded. When a ship crashes, the, their fleet master has to go out and essentially put it down like you would put down a horse and destroy it. Um, we know that the dimensional shifting when they talk about traveling outside of the solar system between star systems, they talk about riding a dimensional pathway that has been discovered through the galaxy as an easier place or easier way to get from point A to point B. So let me give you a, for instance, yeah. if I can travel to get to my destination on a river instead of hoofing it over high mountains. Geez, I'll get in the boat and float down the river. That's easier. All right. There are pathways like that through the galaxy if you shift dimensionally. So are there maps and travel routes that they talk to us about when they do that dimensional travel? Yes. There are standard travel routes in this galaxy. And they said after official first contact, they can provide us maps. Hmm. Sounds good. Yeah. And their station. Mm -hmm. So 
just for the audience, what's it look like or what's to come uh, intel of the space within this mountains or even let's right. Okay, it, it, yeah. it's huge. And immediately Tilcom told us that the Sandia Mountain Information Station is built into the ancient tunnel system left over by the last age of man that runs north south along the eastern edge of the Rockies and has, um, that's the main line. And then there are little side shoots off of the main line. They have miles and miles of tunnels um, under this mountain and extending to the sides into the local New Mexico landscape area and other I guess you would call them under underground habitat facilities where the habitat can be altered to cater, controlled. yeah, climatically controlled to cater to a specific star nation's needs. Gotcha. All right. This tunnel system goes all the way up to Wyoming for sure. And maybe into Montana, it does but at all least that. all the way up to Yellowstone area. Yeah. And, um, we believe that our U.S. military found parts of it. I think that the Denver airport and Cheyenne Mountain connect to parts of it. Yeah, they are. All right. I think that Los Alamos and Sandia National Labs connect with part of it. I think that if you go south to White Sands, there's a military base that hugs the mountains as they extend down southward into southern New Mexico, mm -hmm. south of the Sandias and south of the Manzanos. Mm -hmm. And so Holloman, is that? Holloman. Is that yeah. it, the right Holloman's name? Holloman's over there. Okay, then I'm trying to think of the name of the one that hugs the mountains down south. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, we understand now that we earth humans have taken boring machines and extended the old tunnel system. So you can go from the Sandia Mountain all the way over to Area 51 underground right now, yep. or Area 52, or any of the other military facilities that are off of the main line. Mm -hmm. So, and it's quick, it's fast, it's a maglev system. Indeed, indeed. And so we discovered what was left over too, and also took advantage of it and connected things. Uh, South I-40. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So other questions? Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, I am to find myself with ancient Lemurians because of my past life as being mm -hmm. as well. Uh, mm -hmm. The Tickum shared to you, you know, the ancient Atlantean or Lemurian. <clears throat> All right. So what he did say, is yes, both of those nations, both of those island nations existed prior to the last cataclysmic event, prior to the last big micronova burp from the sun that threw our world into a tailspin and started the, the next, that the previous ice age, all right? It was, the, the oceans were much lower there was much more uh, beach area or land mass area that now is underneath the waves and our oceans are again still rising. We're gonna lose Florida after a while, I'm afraid. They have what they call sunny day flooding. Hmm. They have had for mm, sunny yep. years now. So what they say about Atlantis and Lemuria, um, both had star nation visitors that were common. We know Lemuria had at least 16 different star nation cultures in conclaves or pockets of, of uh, where people gathered together because their people were there. And there were 16 different um, star nations that were on Lemuria in the Pacific Ocean. When the last cataclysmic event came about. The other thing that happened simultaneously to that is those 
nations didn't always see eye to eye with each other. And did they have flight capability like we have airplanes and helicopters now? Yes, they did. And those vehicles are described in detail in India's literature uh, as Vima Vimayas or Vimanas. And I don't remember how to say it now. But you got but, it. You got it. Yeah. Yep. They would describe their vehicles like you and I would describe our car. Yeah. Mine holds six people and I've got the, the latest air conditioning unit and, and these bells and whistles. And so that's the way their airships were described in that literature in that kind of a casual everyday yeah this is what my vehicle has what's yours got okay mm -hmm. tone those nations did not like one another and they did have conflicts but that wasn't what sank both nations beneath the waves they both uh, unfortunately uh, succumbed to the same cataclysmic flood event that the rest of the planet came to. And what the Ponte tell us is that the survivors of that cataclysmic event, the survivors of Lemuria, uh, some of them made it to the coastlines of the continents of Australia, the island nations in Micronesia and Indonesia, that part of the world, Asia, Japan, Alaska, Canada, down our coastline, all the way into South America, down to the tip. Yeah. So you could find survivors straggling from this cataclysm and, and trying to find a new place to live because mm -hmm. their world was gone. All right. The Ponte tell us and the local Native Americans here in the desert Southwest mm -hmm. also tell us that they were gathered up on the beach down in Baja area in Mexico, where the Colorado River empties into the ocean. And the star nations called the ant people and the spider people walked the survivors up the Colorado River and branched off up the little Colorado River and then came over land into New Mexico. The survivors were taken to an area of Western New Mexico and their homes and dwellings and needs were already set up for them there by the Star Nation people on the surface when they arrived. Mm -hmm. So just like you and I might take boat people that came off the ocean trying to escape whatever regime yeah. and we gave them aid and sanction, the Star Nation people, the ant people and the spider people set up housing for the survivors of the Lemurian cataclysm and literally walked them to their new home and that's how the Zuni acquired their land. The Zuni Native American people are on the original land that the Star Nation spider and ant people walked them to. Hmm. And that's where they still live. Gotcha. gotcha. You can see the remnants of the oldest housing that the Star Nation people built for them. They're in ruins now, but you can still see them. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. And uh, speaking of which, so, um, you know, crystals, mm -hmm. you know, it stores actually, you know, information from ages and ages. And might as well say libraries. <laughs> yeah. So, throughout, no, first, really? Throughout, yeah. And throughout the continent, <laughs> and uh, especially where I visit. You know, in the islands, you have caves and you have yes. traces of, you know, crystals. Yes. And if you go further down, well, there's more to it and ancient technology. So then again, uh, Tikkun, 
what what are the is entails regarding specific parts spot sorry where you know special crystals have been stored for for future you know mm, okay yeah. I got a couple of them later on. we do all right so what we got schooled in crystals by Tilcom when we began to learn about the images embedded in Earth's landscape, all right? And he called the images in Earth's landscape the archaeoplanetography. Archaeo means ancient. Planet, of course, is celestial body. Ography is written or recorded. Mm -hmm. So archaeoplanetography is the written or recorded history embedded into the landscape in image form. And if you want to see those images, they're actually not individual images, they're murals, okay? Yeah. So the archaeoplanetography is the science and study of these images, and it's something we didn't know about and Tilcom taught it to us in detail, and I'm still getting lessons in archaeoplanetography as we speak. I've got a, another movie started of new information that they shared with us two days ago, all right? Mm -hmm. So you see the elephant in the elephant's head yeah. embedded in the landscape? If you look at the unoutlined version and then you look at the outlined, you can see how fairly clear that image of that head actually is. Mm -hmm. And even if you hadn't seen the outlined image and if I gave this unoutlined image to a five-year-old and said find the animal head yeah find an elephant oh. wouldn't they all right it's that clear but that head alone is 777 miles across how does that work all right so we got schooled in archaeoplanetography and when we talked about it we talked about crystals and which is why i bring it up and crystals are like libraries. They are like record keepers. They are like books. Um, they mm -hmm. do and have a lattice structure that can be energized and programmed or read, mm -hmm. just like you would read a floppy disk or, or a, a disk. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm old school floppy disk. That was, I've been around for a while. But if you want to store information on a disc, we have disc writers. If you want to read a disc, we have, you just pop it into your computer and it reads it. Crystals are the same way for them. And in Mexico, have you heard of the cave of giant crystals that they discovered well, a couple of decades ago? A couple of years ago. Was well, it yeah. Was it the uh, specific spot below Teotihuacan? No, it was not. The Cave of Dark Giant Crystals are crystals that are the size of houses. Stellanite crystals. Stellanite. I Stellanite. Just, Stellanite. Stellanite. Stellanite crystals. And when they found them, they were mining next to and uh, broke into this huge cavern. cavern of crystals like you might break into a geode. Mm crystals inside but these were giant so if you look up cave of giant crystals in mexico you will bring up images of these huge crystals and when we talked about that area it's marked archaeoplanetography wise on a map with four pyramids pointing to the entrance of that area marking it as a library information source for everything from the dna to the history to the uh, flora and fauna, the animals and plants that are here or have been here in the past. All right, so you're looking for an image of guys in orange suits standing next to giant crystals. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's this cave of giant crystals is 150 degrees. You can only be in it for a maximum of 10 minutes. Period. And it's now been sealed up because it was, they only grow and maintain their viability 
crystals are alive and they still grow. Awesome. Even if you have a small crystal in your possession, yeah. it still grows, guys. It's documented scientific fact. We don't see it because it's so slow, but it's still growing. Yeah. All right. It still changes. Yeah. Can you hold it or subject it to electricity and change things within it? Yes, you can. Yeah. What do you think that the crystal radios were made out of and why uh, that Intel pencils. still that pencil and copper wire? So Intel still makes crystal and things, uh, information storage for your computers. Yeah. And that factory that makes those chips is a half a mile from us here in the a suburb of Albuquerque. And outside of it are piles of huge sand. That's very special sand to for the crystal. Yep, uh, well, to make. Yeah. They have superconductor. We have a number of, I think the fellow that constructed that facility told us there were 24 processing units that it's super magnets. 44. 44? 44. I'm sorry. So we talked to one of the guys that was a contractor that worked here. And yeah, electrician. So these crystals in this cave that you're showing now is sealed up now, but you can see how a single slice of a single crystal from this cave has information and how much information it would have. Just imagine, how much information do you think you're seeing there? You're seeing a world's worth of history and information stored underground here. Mm -hmm. That's what Tilcom told us. Yeah. And uh, what else Tilcom um, disclosed with you regarding the, uh, the properties of crystals that may not be shared, you know, on the, uh, well, all right. So some of it we know, it, information storage devices. Some of it we know as um, power and power conduits. So channeling energy through crystals, okay, is one thing that they do. I don't believe that we can say that their ships run on crystals but it wouldn't surprise me if they weren't part of the construction extruding process. I don't know that for sure. Yeah, there is. I figured. That's what right. Ray Ayers told me. All right. We've had discussions with Tilcom. We've had discussions with their engineer fleet master, Dell. And we've had some discussions with Radar because he's a pilot. So all of them have different aspects of stories of what makes the ships go mm. that we've caught snatches of. We have not asked the Ponte about their technology. What we're telling you now has simply come out in conversation. Yeah. We've never grilled them for technology. We did not ever want to give them the impression that we wanted to get to know them because they were more advanced and we could get stuff like technological stuff from them. We wanted them to know that we wanted to make a friendship first, that that was more important. And the technology could come second. So we've always focused on the cultural aspect of their lives and our lives mm -hmm. and our arts, our sciences um, have taken kind of a back seat to the more cultural everyday stuff. Yeah. So. Excellent, excellent. Now, uh we're going to talk about probably sensitive stuff with the situation that's been going on since last year you know that's affecting a lot of people <coughs> the pandemic but now uh water okay so tilcom and the uh the other the other beings what did it share to you with what's going on because a lot of things are going on right? <laughs> yeah. pick a topic yeah so let's say with all i'm going to call it let's say like the uh, the madness that's been going on from since last year um because there's people that saying you know there's paramilitary para, para corporation that's involving with the secret space programs that you know unleash the the thing right 
uh, other people saying, you know, it's from another group. So what's Thickum, uh point of view with what's been right. going on since last year? What's been going on? All right. From the very beginning, in 2013, mm -hmm. Tilcom began sharing with us a phrase that initially, when he first said it, scared the heck out of me. And he said, we are preparing you for Earth's official first contact. And I went, what? And he explained that the star nations and the federation that of allies that keep Earth protected right now, Earth is in what they refer to as protected planet status. And it's in protected planet status because a couple of the nations from the Orion constellation, known as the Ea, there were two different cultural sects of the Ea here on Earth, one in the Middle East, one in South America. They didn't get along and they had a conflict. And that conflict resulted in destruction of things here on earth and loss of life. Mm -hmm. And that was a little bit more than 5,000 years ago, 6,500-ish mm -hmm. maybe? Six to seven. All right, so the Ea, you and I know as the elongated skull folks. Mm -hmm. Those are the Ea. You've seen the Ea pictures of the elongated skulls in Egypt. You've also seen the skulls that come out of Peru, right? Correct. Okay. So those are two different groups of Ea that come from the Orion area, constellation area of the galaxy, specifically yeah. down by Orion's feet. Mm -hmm. And um, when they had their conflict, and it involved loss of life and destruction of property. The Federation stepped in and said, uh-uh, that's against our rules. You can't come here until we say you can come back. And they kicked the Ea, the elongated skull folks, off the planet, which is why you don't see them now. And they put Earth into protected planet status so that no other star nation could do what they did and get by with it. Make sense? Yeah. All right. We're still in protected planet status. The Ea have sent representatives into our solar system. And in fact, they arrived in June of 17 and had to be announced. Well, when they arrived in the solar system, the Ponte got all upset and contacted us and said, you must put out this information exactly as we say it. And you can go back and look at the tweet where Druidy said, I am to tell you that the Ea have arrived in the solar system. And they did that for all the other star nations who also tap into Twitter and, and social media. Mm -hmm. And it was an official announcement. And so far the Ea are minding their P's and Q's, but to my knowledge, I have not heard from any of the contactees or the experiencers of the Ponte that they've been spotted on planet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, their position with what's been going on from, you know, long time, long time, but let's look at what's going on. Uh, All right. So you, oh. let's get back to official first contact. Oh, sure. They told us that that's happening this fall. We have been waiting since 2013 for the fall of 2021 when Tilcom says 32 star nations that visit our planet wish to introduce themselves publicly. And they're not waiting for disclosure from the military about who's got what they don't care. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They say that we have a planetary disaster coming that they can't stop and we can't stop. And they're trying to help us get ready for it and offering aid and assistance like they did last time. Different star nations helped on different continents. Uh, the Reptarians and the Reptilians helped in Asia. The 
uh, Nordics helped in Northern Europe. The Umo helped in Southern Europe. The Zeta body types and the Ponte helped here in the desert Southwest with one of the exoskeletal nations. Okay, so we had the desert, the ant people and the spider people. So we have a history of star nation aid coming and helping us not only survive the cataclysm, but relearn how to live and uh, introduce us, the survivors to everything from astronomy and mathematics to agriculture and medicine. And we have cultures, indigenous cultures all over the world who say the star people came down and taught us mm -hmm. because that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. That was 12,500 some years ago. And the written records are a little spotty, mm -hmm. but the oral history is consistent and shouldn't be tossed out. That same aid from millennia ago, those same visitors to earth who are kind, who are benevolent, who have been trying to help us are coming back and publicly saying, guys, you have a worldwide disaster coming soon. Your son is showing signs of getting ready to sneeze at you and take out your electrical grid in a heartbeat. You're not ready. You need to get ready because it's going to do more than that. It's not just going to stop there. It's going to become very dangerous to be on your surface for a period of time. And it's going to kill a lot of stuff off that's on the surface and you need to go underground. And they've been consistently saying this since we met them. So official first contact is the introduction of essentially the Galactic Red Cross saying, we're here to help you. Would you like to accept our help? Mm -hmm. We can refuse. We have the right to say, no, get the heck off our planet. We don't want your help. But I think that would be kind of stupid. Yeah. All right. So that's official first contact is being pushed forward by the star nations because the, of the impending cataclysm that's coming here. And they're real serious about it. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking 50 years from now. We're not talking 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. The cataclysm should be starting within the next 11 years. It's gotcha. sun cycle that they are watching like a hawk. And if it doesn't happen in this one, it will likely happen in the next 11 year sun cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So without being said, <coughs> the, did you guys talk with him with the uh, diff different alternatives, how fear is being pushed on the people? Yes, mm -hmm. we have talked about what um, we earth humans call the false flag or fake invasion scenario. Okay. And the rumor is that the powers on of, or, or that earth humans have that are already in space, the United States Navy already has a space force in place. Mm -hmm. There are several private entities that have some ships up there, but we don't know how established they are. We know or believe that um, what used to be the Germans and the, not, the old Nazi regime from 80 years ago, those scientists still maintained a relationship and began to work together, we believe in South America, to develop something that has space capability and dimensional capability. We know it has anti-gravity capability. So we have different earth human factions all going into space at the same time. We know that the Chinese can go to the moon. We know that Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. We know that India has its own folks. We know that Europe has its own space agency. So we have a half a dozen plus international earth human folks going beyond our own atmosphere 
All right. The false flag scenario supposedly is a claim that ET is bad and has is doing something bad to earth humans so that the space force can come into the rescue and look like the good guys and the heroes. Okay. And it introduces the space force and kind of bypasses the how much did this cost and when did you build this? Because they're already the heroes. All right. Mm. However, what our extraterrestrial friends say very seriously is that if a false flag scenario takes place and extraterrestrials are lied about and blamed for murder and destruction that they did not do. If it's made up and they're blaming a star nation for something that awful and they're lying about it, what they said is it's likely that many of the star nations who have come to help us in the impending disaster will likely walk away. Because lying about something that serious is considered so immature and so horrid that as a culture, we would, they would deem us too immature to bother with. We haven't achieved advanced civilization level zero yet, and we're liars and cheats if that happens in their eyes. And so they would walk and assistance would go bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not saying that all the star nations feel that way, but we know some of them do. And official first contact as an event would likely be canceled if that were to be pulled off first. Because yeah. Federation would have to talk about, okay, are they really worth saving? Are earth humans really worth saving? Look at what they call us. Look at what they do to us. Mm -hmm. We're here to offer aid and they're calling us murderers and destroyers. What? What? Mm -hmm. So that's part of that false flag interaction information that Tilcom has provided to us. Right, right. So without being said, Sue, uh, there's, I'm gonna call it as it is. Yeah. They're representative of different stellar system or star mm -hmm. nations mm -hmm. that came here and have an experience of a human, right? So they come to learn about us, yes. Yeah. So I'll take my my instance. Uh I've been trained actually in the uh Lyra system. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. There's people that went through Andromeda from Arcturus. Uh -huh. have, uh, you know, uh, we've had Arcturian system folks. I don't know what they call their planet. We yeah. only know the the Arcturus star by that name and that system. Mm -hmm. but we have met some of those folks. Um, I've heard of the Lyrans. We've met contactees and have drawn some of the Lyran portraits mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Andromeda. All right, so you have to qualify. Are you talking about the Andromeda galaxy near our galaxy? Or are you talking about the Andromeda constellation and star system? Two uh, mostly, mostly the- uh, One of them is in our galaxy, the other is a galaxy. Yeah, no, mostly the constellation. Okay, that's what yeah. I thought. Just just qualify it, <laughs> making sure. Because yeah. people ask the Ponte, do you travel to other galaxies? And the honest answer is the capability is there. They do have maps of other galaxies, including Andromeda. Mm -hmm. However, it is not a common thing for them to travel, the Ponte to travel to another galaxy. They yeah. pretty much are staying, they got plenty to do in this galaxy, is essentially what they tell us. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to travel to another galaxy? Yes. Yes, it is. 
Yeah. We have billions, billions with a B, stars in this galaxy. That means more than a billion or billions of planets. And then you have to think of the number of sentient people on those planets. You have more extraterrestrial nations and beings than you can count. The ones that we see are just in our little arm of the galaxy. Seven, 10% of the galaxy, maybe, is what we see clearly from our night skies. Mm -hmm. Not very much. Yeah. Not unless you've got the Hubble or something else. But the, the nations that visit us with a few exceptions, pretty much come from our local Sagittarius Orion arm of, of the galaxy here. Mm -hmm. Not we're not we're not seeing beings from the opposite side of the spiral arm of the galaxy. Yeah. We're seeing our local neighbors. Yeah. And the unusual thing that Tilkum told us is when you don't know the origin of another star nation being. Mm -hmm. The common translation for the catch-all term you call just anybody is cousin. Mm -hmm. Because they recognize that in some fashion, we're all related. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how yet. They haven't asked. So. All right. And on that same question, did you or with your faculties or <coughs> took them, uh, saw that, wow, there's a lot of let's say humans that were or that probably had their stages or their training in other star uh, system stellar and came through here uh -huh. within the experience to uh, mm -hmm. actually do you know uh specific works mm -hmm. especially in these times mm -hmm. so please share your all right so, this. like you we have talked to other people who begin to recognize that they have memories of other places that are not Earth. They have memories of other knowledge that isn't on Earth. They have memories of other architecture, clothing, faces of nations that are not like yours and mine. And they're in an earth human body and they're trying to figure out how do I know this stuff? All right. How do I feel like, why do I feel like I've been to these places? I know them in such detail. And some of the contactees are still in training and traveling back and forth. All right. So I don't know how recently you traveled or how old your memories were. And what Tilkum tells us is that there are a couple of possibilities. Some star nation explorers, in order to fully understand another sentient being, will merge with that being and live with them for a period of time in a shared body in order to completely understand them and their culture before they exit again, go back home and say, ah, this is what these people are like. Mm -hmm. This was my exploratory experience. So it's a merging of individuals consciousness in one body as a viable means of planetary cultural exploration. Some of that can be done at a distance. You don't have to be on planet to do it. Some of them have to be local. Yep. on the nation it's not common but it does exist so in your instance or in other contactees who feel like they were trained on another world or came with knowledge of another planetary culture or feel like you know what i don't know why i say it but earth isn't my home somewhere else is mm -hmm. And I don't know why I say that, because I know I was born here. It doesn't make sense to me. So they have this merged understanding confusion because whoever merged with them didn't say, oh, by the way, hi, 
my name is so and so and I'm merging with you so that I learn about you. Okay. They don't have that memory. They just have the memory of the activities and the actions or the learning. So we have seen that we have seen just plain old telepathic sharing. We have seen uh, contactees who feel as if they physically have been taken from their beds to another place, trained, and then brought back. Um, and they have the scratches and scars and other things to show for it. So we can't say that every situation where somebody feels like I'm not from here or I've been to another place, but I can't explain it is the same. And we interview those people to try and understand which of the likely scenarios that bring you these memories is the one that happened to you. Does that make sense now? Totally sense. Okay. Totally sense. I hope that helps. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I figured it might. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, telepathy works. Who knew? That again? Telepathy works. Who yeah. knew? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, Sue, we're going to let the people having a chance, actually. Oh, Sue. absolutely. What do they want to know? Questions, Barb. Before yeah, doing this, questions. yeah, before doing this, Sue, I just want to share again where the people can't, where the people can uh see some of your information so you have official first contact uh dot com yes the that's the yeah. website yeah good uh you have sue walker dot com yeah that's my psychic and medical intuitive stuff only okay and you have also the infinite voice project dot org okay so we need yeah. to explain that one the infinite voice when you translate the Pontes word for telepathy, mm -hmm. it translates as infinite voice. Okay, so that's their phrase. That means I'm talking to you mind to mind. Okay, the infinite voice project is our nonprofit educational branch set up by one of our contactees who's a regular contactee in Michigan. He helped us set up the Infinite Voice Project and it's there for, uh, uh, its, its mission statement is education, cultural educational material so that it helps earth humans prepare for official first contact and introduction to star nations visiting our world. Gotcha. So that's what the Infinite Voice Project is about. Gotcha. So if and you want to donate, it's tax deductible now. All right, sounds good. And on YouTube, uh, Mira Citus one. Oh on boy, I don't know. I think that might be it on YouTube. I know, I, you know, this is going to sound bad, but I don't even know what to call my own YouTube channel. I thought it was my name, but it could be Miracidus one. And it shares with you, one, a number of archaeoplanetography videos. Two, the Ponte, this gets back into a description. There was a treaty that was agreed upon between Earth humans and star nations in 1971 in August, 50 years ago. That treaty gave Earth five decades of time and asked the star nations visiting Earth to not provide photographic evidence, video evidence, or technology stuff to the Earth humans during that time. They wanted a period of time to get our people ready for officials first contact so they wouldn't freak out. All right. And you are seeing more and more and more ET, UFO stuff as everyday normal, right? If somebody sees a UFO, they go, wow, I saw a UFO. And then they go on about their daily life. They don't freak out usually. Mm -hmm. Now, if they see a person that doesn't look like them, 
that's when we see the freak out factor because people have it hit home reality wise for them and they go through a period of overwhelm and the telepathy 101 primer along with our book inviting et talks about that 